Well, hello and welcome to the November 19th, 2023 online sermon from Christian Fellowship Church. Christian Fellowship Church is located in Northwest Indiana, specifically Hammond, Indiana. And our contact information is at the end of this video. Use it to either call the church or email the church, find out our service times, some of the activities that were going on, or get access to our podcast. There's a lot of information from the World Wide Web. As we come to November 19th, this is the day we're having our church outreach. And if you are obviously not able to come to our church, be praying for us as we have our Thanksgiving outreach, where we provide a meal for the community. And we're hoping, as always, to have enough food, enough workers, and visitors to come that we can share the gospel with. We have a great passion as we believe the Bible wants us to share the good news of Jesus Christ. The word gospel means good news, and there is a reason good news needs to go out, is because there's bad news. The bad news is that all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. All people need an answer for what sin has caused. Sin has caused them to be under judgment, under God's wrath, and they are going to have to pay this penalty not only with their physical life, but with a spiritual life as well. And that is why they need Jesus. For Jesus gives life. And as we'll see in our study, he gives peace. Have your Bibles open to Esther. Esther chapter 5 will be there in a second. We're going to transition in and out of our music ministry first. Be blessed by our music team. Good morning, welcome to Christian Village of Church, Peace, and Jones and Jones.
Do you like stories? I like stories. I think most people like stories. And I have two stories for you today. One is tied to the story of Esther that we've been progressing through. And if you've been watching these videos, you know we've been looking at the wonderful story of Esther, of this woman who becomes queen, who saves her people. And so that's where our focus will be in a bit. But I also have a second story that helps illustrate the principles that we learned in the book of Esther and looked at the principles that we're going to look at today, and that is the story of Alvin York. Do you know who Alvin York is? Most people today don't, and that's sad because Alvin York is better known with the title Sergeant York, and Sergeant York is perhaps one of America's greatest heroes. He's one of my greatest heroes personally, and he is, like Esther, a real individual. He fought in World War I, and World War I is always important to me because that is the war my grandfather, George Bachman, fought in. And when I sometimes reference my grandfather dying on March 18, 1968, it's that grandfather, Doc, um, George Bachman, who died that day. And Sergeant York fought in World War I, and I've mentioned him before, and I realize that, again, most people haven't heard of him. I don't know if you have or not. There's so much information about him. I'm going to talk about him again next week uh, because I want to keep pulling in the facts. His life is so fascinating, and I think this should be like an incentive for you to come back and watch next video, like the next video because you want to see or learn more about this man's life. But there's a couple reasons I wanted to use him, especially at this time. There's the tie-in, first and foremost, is the fact that it is a story, Sergeant York's uh, life story is one of how God had his hand on this individual. And in our studies of Esther, we've been talking about the invisible hand of God, how God is working to work all things together for good for those who love Christ Jesus, how he gets involved, whether it's sending guardian angels of Psalm 91 or guarding an angel that we are going to enter entertain unawares in Hebrews 13. Somehow, some way, God is working throughout our lives. And we're going to 
we always recognize he's in, working in the lives of all people. And we've used some illustrations of that as well. And so there's a great tie-in you'll, you'll see as we progress through the story. But it, there's also into the season that we're in a tie-in because it's Thanksgiving season. This video is airing on the Sunday that we are going to be having our Thanksgiving outreach. And then we're going to go into Thanksgiving week in America here. And the idea of having turkey is prevalent, right? Well, this story ties into the fact that Thanksgiving and turkeys more so um, was a big thing for Sergeant York. And we'll, you'll see that in a second. And then this story with Sergeant York occurred on October 8th, 1918. And it's one month before the end of the war. And it's going to play a key part in the end of the war. And the end of the war, World War I, was November 11th. At, uh, uh, at 11 a.m. And the idea is 11-11. And I, how does it say? Um, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. And I don't know if you know that. Originally, that was recognized as Armistice Day, the end of World War I, the war to end all wars, right? And we, it has now become recognized as Veterans Day, which we recognized last Sunday at Christian Fellowship Church. And then we're going to see as this story plays out, how both Esther's story and Sergeant York's story has a role in the Jews being in the land of Israel and the, the continuity with the Jews. So let me just tell you, Sergeant York did something incredible, something that like when you watch an action movie and people like watching action movies and you'll see where the hero comes in and it's like one versus 200 and all of a sudden there's guns blazing and people rushing and the superhero, the hero of the story, is able to defeat, against all odds, 200 people. Well, for Sergeant York, what seemed to be impossible, that's exactly what he did. He was born on December 13th, 1887, in a log cabin, a real log cabin. And he was born in Paul Mall, Tennessee. He grew up in a very rural area. He had a limited education because his father needed him to be working on the farm. So as a young boy, I think he went to school for a couple months, and that was it, and he had to go work on the farm. His father will die in 1911, and so if he's 1911, it's basically he is, um, he's about 24, 25 years old, and the responsibility of providing for the family all falls on him. Now, as he's grown up, he has become an incredible shot. And his family relies on him to go out and hunt what? In the area? Turkeys. And he becomes an expert in, in shooting turkeys as well as shooting other game bird. And here is the tie-in to Thanksgiving because he was such an incredible shot. And that will play a part in what happens to him. So when he was about, let me think, uh, about 28 years old, a good friend of his dies. And Alvin York, Sergeant York, was somebody that was a partier. He was a heavy drinker. And when his good friend dies, in a, I believe it was a, in a bar-related incident, he ends up getting shaken and he comes home and his mother challenges him, his mother who's a born-again believer. And it's at that point he becomes a Christian. And because he thinks it through, and when his mother says, do you want to die like a drunk, like your father? It really hits home, and he becomes a born-again believer. Well, he doesn't have much time to you know, develop a lot of his faith, because World War I breaks out, and he gets drafted in 1917, and he's assigned to the 82nd Infantry Division, deployed to France in the... Um, the end of the war, but he's sent to the Western Front. And perhaps you've heard that great title, that book, All's Quiet on the Western Front. It's a book that I have never read, but I've read summaries of it, that it is about a German soldier, and it is a, a book designed to show that um, the war is bad, and also gives great insight that the Jews were not the reason for the Germans losing World War I. Hence, that's why Hitler wouldn't let the movie be shown. Hitler would not let the movie um, 
All is Quiet on the Western Front. And I understand there's just been a remake, re remake of the movie. I haven't seen that either. But the idea of the Western Front is the land basically between Germany and France. And I'm going to show a map on it on, on, uh, on the Sunday that I present this message. And it was the location where the most Americans in the war died. And this area where York is at, it has a cemetery that has over 14, I think, thousand Americans who died in World War One. So what happens is on that morning of October 8th is that York's um, troops, York and his fellow soldiers, are pinned down by the Germans, and they're going to be slaughtered basically. But York decides to um, to go around the flank, around the side of the Germans. And I shouldn't say decides, he's ordered to go around with a, with a small squadron of men. And the men start to get picked off. They start to get wounded, they start to get killed. And what happens is, is instinct takes over for York. And before you know it, it's almost as if, and if you ever see the movie about him, he talks about he started hunting the Germans like he hunted turkeys. And he begins picking them off. And the... The, the, the result is that when it's all said and done, there are 27, 25 Germans dead, and he, with his um, wounded squadron of just seven men that are left, captures 132 more Germans. For his effort, he was promoted in the field from corporal to sergeant, and he was awarded the Distinguished Cross. He was given the Medal of Honor, and um, basically, I think, one of the most decorated soldiers ever. I think there's a close to 90 medals he gets from this account and from other things he does in the war. Um, General J. Pershing of Pershing Rifles uh, fame, for those of you who are, who are on a campus, and they, it, it's part of, I think, of the ROTC, the Pershing Rifles, a good friend of mine was in it when I was in college at Ohio State, um, gave him his medal. Here's the thing. What, what he does is so incredible, and we're going to go more into the details next week, is that people literally thought it was a made-up story. The generals think it's a made-up story. And when they are about to give him the Medal of Honor, they won't give it to him. They won't give it to him because they think he's made it up. And I'll go into the story next week more so of how he has to prove it to him, which is absolutely fascinating. But when the general asked him, you know, how did you do it? This is his exact quote. He says, sir, it was not man's power. A higher power than man power guided and watched over me and told me what to do. And just an amazing story of how God solved or, or watched over him when he was pinned down. It was like 200 Germans. I don't know, seven, eight, ten um, uh, machine gun um, centers, and he, it, it was just phenomenal what he did. God's favor was clearly on his, his, on him. And God's favor is a blessing, and God's favor is something that you want as well. If we're all honest, we all want God's favor, and it's tied to that invisible hand that we have been talking about. As believers in Jesus Christ, who we are at Christian Fellowship Church, we want God involved in our life, and we want God's favor. And, and last week, I encouraged people to be praying for it and asking, God, I need your favor. I want your favor. The idea of favor is an important one in the Bible. And if you didn't watch that podcast, I encourage you, or excuse me, watch that video or listen to the podcast. I encourage you to do that because the reality of it is there's so much in the Bible about seeking God's favor. Well, the story of Esther is a story of a woman who has God's favor. We saw the word favor really appear a lot in chapter 2, but it really appears here in chapter 5. Now, a recap of the story of Esther is basically this. is chapter 1. We come to a story that is a true account of a king called Ahasuerus. Some Bibles call him Xerxes. He's, he's known by both names. But he is an evil king who reigns over the largest world territory at that time of <coughs> of land from India basically to Greece. He is wicked and in chapter 1 we see his ego get to him and basically he gets rid of his queen. What I say beloved queen, I don't know how well he loved her, but 
he does lament by chapter 2 that she's gone. So by chapter 1, he, he gets rid of this queen. Chapter 2, we come and we learn that there's going to be a beauty contest, not your Ameri Miss America pageant. It is a vile sexual contest that does tie into beauty, but it is one that we have to understand does deal with sexual perversion. And Esther gets picked. And we got to feel sad for Esther that she had to go through this. But it's the world in which she's living, a world in which there's great animosity towards the Jewish people, and hence she will not tell people that she's Jewish at this time. Her cousin Mordecai is a high official in the um, government at this time. However, he also is hiding that he is Jewish. And so we look at this idea, at least we imply, it's implied, because he tells her not to let, he, let, he tells her not to let, the process that the king's people know that she's that she's Jewish, all right? And so the implication in his thought is, is that he won't let people know that he's Jewish as well. So chapter 2 deals with Esther being picked as queen. Chapter 3, this evil man comes on the scene. His name is Haman. Haman is akin to the Adolf Hitler of our day. Um, even in our day, Adolf Hitler is despised. It was a couple weeks ago that we saw... A college football um, stadium had a trivia contest before the game, before the game, and it was at Michigan State University, and all of a sudden, a picture came up of Adolf Hitler, and for the next week, week and a half, Michigan State had to go on and on and on and apologize. That they wouldn't even, uh, they shouldn't have even have used a picture of Hitler in a trivia contest. This is 2023, and there's still hatred for Adolf Hitler. Well, Haman is on that level. And in chapter 3, we have him enter in the scene. And we recognize he's no small man in power. He is the second in command of the entire large kingdom that we've been talking about. But because Mordecai, Esther's cousin, won't bow to him, he gets so angry that he wants to wipe out Mordecai, but not just wipe out Mordecai. He wants to wipe out all the Jews. He manipulates the king and gets a plan in motion that 11 months from the day of um, this decree, he will be able to kill the Jews. It is an amazing plan to have a Holocaust. And the dates come up because, I shake my hand, because he was like rolling the dice, roll, throwing the lots. And Haman, we saw, was appealing to the God of his invisible hand, his God's invisible hand. He was hoping that fate would work and it would be the perfect time to have these Jews wiped out. When would it be? And it was 11 months. Unbeknownst to him, it was enough time for the Jews to get prepared for this oncoming onslaught. But I digress. Right now, as the story's playing out, and if you're reading it for the first time, you're on edge by the time you come to chapter 3. And when people begin to learn the story, um, what, what, the, what has happened with Haman and his plan, when you come to chapter 4, there's nothing but anguish, and anguish was the key word of chapter 4. The pain, the horror, the, sor the, the sorrow, like, oh my goodness, everyone's going to be wiped out. And as we come to chapter 5, we don't know how the story is going to turn out, but we begin to see there's favor. And the key thing between chapters 4 and 5 was that as we left, there's a great verse in Esther where Mordecai, the cousin, challenges Esther to say, hey, you better go talk to the king. And Esther comes back and says, like, if I go talk to the king and I'm not invited... I could be killed. And so basically, Mordecai basically says, you better do it. And the great verse that we see is in verse 14. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. And you and your father's household will perish. And who knows whether you've not attained royalty for such a time as this. And the implication is that you have gotten to this position for this particular moment. And... You never saw him say, God put you here. Because the mystery of this wonderful book is that God is never mentioned. But yet, by implication, we always know that God's hand is on the story. That's the genius of this book. Well, as we came to chapter 5, we didn't know whether the king was going to kill Esther. She could have been killed right away. But instead, he accepts her. He, he welcomes her into the court. And she turns and says, hey, can we have a banquet? He he says, okay, and she goes, make it for me, you, and Haman. 
And Haman has gone to the first banquet. In the middle of the banquet, the king says, what's your request, Esther? And Esther goes, let me have another banquet. And that'll be tomorrow. And that's where we leave everything. And Esther has been shown favor over and over. Remember, that's our key word. Look at verse 2. When the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court, she obtained favor in his sight. The good graces, she was going to be blessed. Well, as the evening ends, we now turn to focus on Haman. Esther was a person who had favor on her. Haman is absent favor. Haman's pride gives him no peace. That's where we're going with this story. We pick up now in chapter 5, verse 9. This is after the first night. Then Haman went out that day glad and pleased of heart. And when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, and that he did not stand up or tremble before him, Haman was filled with anger against Mordecai. Filled with anger. It's like rage takes over him. Now think about this. This is the second man, most powerful man in the world. He's just been invited to an exclusive dinner party. And you've been invited today to a dinner party, I might say, to the ground on Sunday. The idea is that, hey, you know, you have this great dinner party, and it's a great privilege to have the opportunity to be with the queen and to be with the king. But Haman was so angry because out of all the people in the kingdom, one person won't bow to him, and he's furious. And so Haman controlled himself, however, which I think is God's grace in verse 10, and went to his house and, and sent for his friends and his wife, Zeris. Zeris is a Persian woman's name. Um, verse 11, then Haman recounted to them the glory of his riches and the number of his sons and the instance where the king had magnified him and how he had promoted him above the princes and servants of the king. So this isn't like, hey, you know what happened today? This is, look how great I am. This is bragging to the nth degree. That's all that is. You can put verse 11, he's bragging. Look at me. Look at me how great I am. Look at me how wonderful I am. Look at me, 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 me. Then there's no credit that God has allowed him, or God has put him in this position, and, and that others might have had to play a role as well. Haman also said, Even Esther the queen, let no one but me come with the king to the banquet, which she had prepared. And tomorrow I am also invited by her with the king. So it's like filling up a balloon in the, for the air, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yet all of this does not satisfy me. Every time I see Mordecai the Jew sitting in the king's gate. So he is furious. Now, I think because he had the power maybe to arrest Mordecai or you know, have punishment come, I, I believe Mordecai must have had a significant amount of authority. Okay, so it would have been no small thing for him to have gone after Mordecai. But you're gonna see, I think he's pushed to the limit. And and so when God um, um well, when, more, when Haman gets the king to be able to say, okay, wipe out all the Jews, I think the plan was, okay, now all the Jews, you're going to find Mordecai's a Jew, and that's part of the plan. you got to do that. So the idea is that Mordecai would have been killed under Haman's other plan where he didn't have to have this one-to-one -one correspondence. But I think now, because he gets so puffed up, we're going to see what happens when his wife says, hey, you got to kill him. Then Zerus, his wife, and all his friends said to him, Have a gallows fifty cubits high made, and in the morning ask the king to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go joyfully with the king to the banquet. And the advice pleased Haman, so he had the gallows made. So the idea you see is that he is still subservient to the king, but he's pretty confident, and she's pretty confident, and his friends are pretty confident, that you know, you're, you're getting invited to these special dinner parties, and you are someone that should be able to get what you want now, you want this guy killed, let's do it. Now, the interesting thing is, is when we think of a gallows, we think of like, uh, like in the wild, wild west where there was a rope and you know, you'd know hang somebody from a tree and the rope would go around their neck and they would choke and they would die that way or die from a broken neck. That is not this type of gallows. This is uh, a long pole. And ironically, um, they even have stone in, you know, in, inscriptions where they show pictures from Persia of these like poles and basically think of sticking a pole that's like a pencil or, or or like a nail right up somebody's back if it was that big enough and they would just writhe in pain for days until they died. A horrendous methodology of bringing about death. Eventually the Romans are going to take this methodology and come up with the plan of crucifixion and the uh, form of this death was absolutely horrible. They, it, I, I went through some um, 
some websites this week looking at this, and one website that I could cite said that Darius, the previous Persian king, had at one time killed 3,000, I think, at one time on this, to this type of methodology. Uh, a horrendous form of killing somebody. And to have it 75 feet high, we don't know if it was just one long pole of 75, more likely it was built up 75 feet, and then they would maybe put a six or seven or 10 foot pole on top of that, so that in the end it would all height, reach a height of 75 feet. The idea is that he wants everyone to see it. He wants everyone to experience the joy he has in crushing his enemy. And so, as we come to this, you know, you, you got to see that basically um, that Haman is an evil man. He, he's manipulated the king and he's gotten most of what he's wanted. Now he just wants to have it all. And he's, <laughs> he, he's at a dinner party and he never asks, why, why am I here? He's really self-deceived. You know, sometimes people, you come to a dinner party, you say, why am I here? Like if people were asked at our dinner party on Sunday, why am I here? It's because we care for people, we love people, but we want to share the gospel. If maybe if Haman would have asked the queen, she would have said, Haman, it's because you hate my people and you plan to kill them. And maybe he, he, through humility, he, at that point, he would have reverted and, and stopped. But obviously, he didn't even have the wherewithal, the understanding to say, hey, why am I invited? He just attributed to ego. <clears throat> and so, a big spoiler alert, Everything that he's doing is digging his own hole. We're going to go into this more next week. But in the end, Haman's going to be killed on these gallows himself. He, he is just somebody that is, has been blinded by his, his pride. And so if I'm looking at principles that I'm looking at this story, remember the big picture is through the story of Esther is how God is working to save the Jewish people. So you never want to forget that, that the book of Esther is that God has promised the Jewish people that they're always going to exist. And therefore, Haman's plan could never work out and how God had his hand on Esther. But as we look through the story and as we play it out, there's certain principles that we see in operation that we're all part of this story. And one of them is from Haman. It's the idea of pride. I think when we look at the story of Haman, we can say fear pride because it will destroy you. Pride is where you're self-puffed up. You're, you're basically somebody that is, you're arrogant. You, you have a big head. You think the world of yourself. You think the world revolves around you. Haman wanted everyone to bow to him. He wasn't the king. If anything, he should have pointed people to the king, like Christians. We point people to King Jesus, right? And I believe, you know, if, if he would have done that, it wouldn't have ended like this to him. But no, pride is something I believe that that ties into the invisible world because it gets to our spirit and the spirit is that we think that we are like God and I think as I'm going to read a couple verses here uh, references even when Satan tempted Eve she says basically you're going to be like God and it appeals to pride Satan was somebody that thought he could be like God and that's why I say it's an invisible thing pride comes out in all that you do there's a great verse that in the book of Proverbs, it says this, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Why is that? Because there's an invisible hand of God that he will not honor pride. And this is why I say fear, fear pride. If you have pride, God will not let you get away with it. People everywhere, we all struggle. Humans struggle with pride. We have to. It's part of sin. And there's... Um, an excerpt that I found that said many theologians are convicted are of the conviction that pride is the very essence of sin um, because of like when Lucifer Satan said I will be like the most high he was appealing to pride when he tried to tempt Eve you will be like God in Genesis 3 5 you are appealing to pride and so Warren Wiersbe wrote didn't Haman know that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall or that a man's pride will be bring him low as Proverbs 29 23 teaches, anybody who boasts about position, wealth, family, or anything else ought to heed the words of John the Baptist, that a man can receive nothing except to be given to him from heaven. Think about that. Because the reality of it is, is if we have anything good, it's because God gave it to us. For who makes you different from another, asked the Apostle Paul in chiding the Corinthians. And he says, what, what do you have that you didn't receive? Now, if you did receive it, 
Why do you glory as if you had not received it? Meaning that somebody else worked at it. And obviously that God was working all of life to make sure that you had some type of blessing. And so what we need to recognize is God hates pride. I came across a website that I thought was really good by a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary, a man named Alan Parr. I'm going to put his picture up on the screen. And he had 15 reasons that are ways that sin suddenly comes into our life through pride. And we all have to recognize these. And if you recognize any of these, any of these in yourself, you have to recognize that you've got a problem. Even if you've done it one time. But if you're living like this, it, it really gets you bad. Listen to these. Number one, you, pride has crept into your life if you're assuming you already know something when someone else is teaching it. When you immediately tune someone out who starts teaching you something that you may be somewhat familiar with, that is an example of pride. It is the assumption that you know everything about the subject being communicated and that this person, whom you see as inferior in knowledge to you, cannot teach you something new. Second, Seeing yourself as too good to perform certain tasks. When someone asks you to do something and your immediate thought is, I, of all people, shouldn't have to do that. That task is for someone else. That is a sign of pride that we should consider dealing with. Next time this thought arises, ask yourself, if Jesus was willing to leave heaven and come to earth for me, then who am I to say I'm too good to do what someone asks of me to do? Third, pride comes into your life <coughs> when you're being too proud to ask for help. There is something to be said about independence. However, there are times in life when we must all admit that something is beyond our capacity and that we need help. The unwillingness to recognize our own shortcomings and need for help is a sign of pride. Fifth, feeling the need to consistently teach people things. Have you ever been in a group where someone feels the need to dominate the conversation and seemingly spill everything they know without giving other people the opportunity to share? Sometimes this can be a sign of pride because when a person knows something that they know most other people don't know much about, it creates a sense of pride within them. Is that you? Number five, you talk about yourself a lot. When you talk a lot about your accomplishments, your education, your title, your position, your financial status, that's a sign of pride. The Bible says be quick to listen and slow to speak. When we talk about ourselves, a lot of it reveals that we have not yet learned how to come up out of ourselves and focus on the interest of others. That's Philippians 3. Two, three teaches. Number six, thinking you are better than others who are different or less fortunate. This one is subtle because a person can appear to be humble and caring on the outside. However, in their minds, they secretly think they are better than other people who may have different backgrounds, cultures, or experiences that they do. Number seven, when you disregard the others, pride has come into your life. When you disregard the advice of others, pride has come into your life. This has its root in thinking that you have all the answers to life and that you somehow don't need or see the value in other people's perspectives. It carries the idea that you believe you can be successful and accomplish your goals without the counsel of others. Number eight, when you are consistently critical, this is when we tend to put others down often because there is a deep-seated need for us to feel better about ourselves. People who are critical are that way because they secretly see themselves as exempt from the very things they criticize others. This is pride. Now, if we go through this list, I hope you know, you're know you recognizing, at times, we've all done this. I know I have. And it's humbling. And this is why you need to turn to Jesus. Well, but I'm not done. I'm only halfway through. Number nine, consistent need for attention and affirmation. When someone consistently needs to be the center of attention in public or secretly craves consistent affirmation for their accomplishments, looks, personality, serving, intelligence, or, or physique, this is a sign of pride. Number 10, unable to receive constructive criticism. When a person struggles to allow other people to speak into their lives and provide helpful feedback, it is a sign of pride because they are too blinded by their own pride to see the value in what someone is sharing with them and how it can help them make a, them a better person. Number 11, overly obsessed with their physical appearance. Certainly, you should take care of yourself and exercise, but when a person is constantly obsessed with how they look and how they flaunt their physique, um, their figure in front of others with the hopes that people will notice and gawk at them. This is vanity, which is yet another form of pride. Number 12, pride comes in your life when you're unwilling to submit to authority. You're unwilling to submit to authority. When a person is unwilling to submit to authority at work, church, at home, or in any other relationship, it's because deep within the person they believe they can make better decisions than the person God has placed over them. So they submit outwardly, but inwardly they struggle to accept the subordinate position they are in. Number 13, ignoring other people's attempt to communicate with you. Again, ignoring other people's attempt to communicate with you. Owie. 
When you consistently blow people off who text or email you, you are essentially minimizing the importance of this person in their communication and saying to yourself that they are not important enough to invest your pre precious time into. We all get busy, but acknowledging a person's attempt to connect sends the message of importance to the other person. Number 14, justifying our sin instead of admitting it. When someone graciously points out a sin in your life and you get defensive and you start to justify it, it isn't that a dangerous place to be? Because if you're using scripture to support uh, um, your justification for your sin, then you are essentially saying that you know better than God. Number 15, name dropping. When you consistently associate yourself with people who have prominent positions and publicly drop it in conversations in hopes that other people will think you are equally as important as the people you associate yourself with, this is a very subtle form of pride. And so that's Alan Parr's 15 reasons, and I think they're excellent. And if you need to, I'll send the link out if you email the church. But I want to add one more, 16, it's mine. Number 16, pride comes in your life when you ignore God's word. The Bible is God's word. And if you believe that no one, including God, is going to tell you what to do, you're not going to read the God. You're not going to read God's word. So if I humbly need God's word every day. I got to be. It's the light unto my path. The light, you know, it, it is that which guides me, directs me. I need it every day. Prideful people don't need God's word. <coughs> so you can see, pride is something that you can creep into your life in so many different ways. I encourage you to check your heart against this list and ask God to help you identify some ways that you are struggling with pride so that you can exhibit more humility in your life. Humble yourself before God. Humble yourself before man. With God, you have to admit that he's greater than you. He can tell you what to do. Prideful people, I want to make sure you all understand, lose in the end. That's why I wanted to give the big picture of where Haman goes. Haman is a prideful person. He doesn't have God's favor in his life. And he loses. He loses. And... And favor in his life would have been that he would have been humble. So God wasn't working in his life. So critical. And tied to this is the next principle that I want to go over just briefly here is that the second principle is K-N-O-W, know, know God, and you'll know peace. With N-O, know God, there's no peace. Because when a person has a relationship with God, and they have it through Jesus Christ. And this expression is used in a similar way. No Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. The idea is when you become a believer in Jesus Christ, you can have peace. And Haman had no peace. Um, obviously, um, he could have come to faith in God and would have looked to the Jewish Messiah, which we recognize the Jews of the Old Testament did which would have been Jesus, and he would have had favor, but he didn't. We believe Esther did, and it's evident how she had self-control, and she waited with patience four or five days to bring this request to the king to, to protect her people, which we're going to play out in the next chapter. But you have to be aware that the Bible talks about the fact that if you do not have a relationship with God, a relationship now we understand full picture with Jesus, you have no peace. Peace is the absence of war. It's a sense of tranquility. And a person needs to understand the reason they have no peace is that God says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 48, verse 11, there is no peace for the wicked. And then also in uh, the Bible, it says, the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches all of his paths. His own iniquities will capture him, and he will be held in the courts of his sin. He will die for lack of instruction, and in the greatness of his folly, he will go astray. Listen, there is no peace for the person that doesn't know <coughs> that God, and as we say in the New Testament saints, know Jesus. Jesus himself says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world giveth, I give unto you. He said that on the last night of his life, that he was telling his disciples when they believe and have trust in him, they would have peace. With Haman, there was no peace. And, and when we look at the story of Sergeant York, and I didn't get into it, I'll get maybe more into it next week, but the reality of it is he was a drunk, he was a fighter, he was a, he'd go to the bars and just get in all kinds of trouble. And it, it was indicative of a life that had no peace, but when he comes to God, he gets peace. Peace, that settled state, tranquility, no war. And, 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 and 
so many people fight within their conscience and, and God has used the conscience to convict us and because there's this constant war going on, there is no peace inside them. And I remember about 25 years ago, I gave a sermon saying, if you're a born again believer, you have peace. And I had a person who had been attending our church for a couple months and she, after the service, she wrote me a scathing note. How dare you say believers have peace? I, I don't have any peace and I was trying to get her to understand because she has no peace that she needed to really check at her life. And she eventually left the church and, and I um, followed it. I, and I know for a fact that she died never repenting. And she never had peace in her life. And it was one of the saddest stories that I ever seen. But it, but it was hard for me as well because here's this woman who I believe was in her 40s at the time when she was attending church here. And she was someone who proclaimed to be a longtime believer, but had no peace. She had no peace. And I want you to be aware how important it is for you to have peace today. So two great stories. Um, the story of Sergeant York, the story of Esther. Um, and, and both of those have similarities that they're both incredible stories where all seemed lost at one point. For York and his group, his troop, they thought they were going to be killed. Esther thought all the Jews were going to be killed. But in the end, both came through. There's, in both stories, an incredible story of heroism. What York, Sergeant York did was one of those heroic things. He didn't know he was going to be able to overcome all the machine gunners. 132, 160, 70 Jew, Germans that he fought against. It was one basically against the 170, and he came out and wanted captures of all. And then Esther, she could have died. The king could have said, I'm having a bad afternoon. You came in at a time when I was having some other women to be entertaining me. You've interrupted me. How rude. Get out of here. You're dead. So we cannot, we cannot underestimate what she did. And then third, I said that this story had a tie-in to the Jews um, when I talked about York's. Well, obviously, Esther does because it's a plan how God made sure the Jewish people wouldn't have a holocaust back in the days of Haman. How does Sergeant York's story tie into that? Well, it ties into the fact that because York plays a part in this vital role, this helps tip the war. This, this part of the Western Front helps tip the war and it ends and the Allies win and Germany and its, and its team loses. Well, who's on the German team? Well, the Ottoman Empire is on there. And often I think when I think of the Ottoman Empire, I think of like days gone by, the 1500s, the 1200s. But the Ottoman Empire went all the way till 1917, 1918. And um, it was with World War I that the British conquered the Ottoman Empire. And they are able to do what? Take back Jerusalem, which begins the preparations to give Israel back to the Jews, which they officially got in 1948 which we're watching the whole world still upset about in 2023. So Sergeant York played a role in that as God, I know, had his hand on that because he wanted the Americans and the British to win that war. Now, you might be wondering if you're visiting here why there's so much hatred for the Jews and maybe you have a hatred for the Jews. Well, the reason there's worldwide hatred, you always know from the Bible, the answer is, is because God has chosen the Jewish people to be the conduit through which he gives this message of Jesus. You say, <coughs> why did he pick them? W were they better than anyone else? No, the Bible is clear. Passages like Ezekiel 18, excuse me, Ezekiel 16 and others make it really clear that Israel wasn't more worthy. God just made a choice. And because they're his choice, they're his chosen people. They're the blessed people from which the message has gone out. And it hasn't always gone out perfectly. And we recognize the Jews are not a perfect people. But the message that God has sent out is perfect. And it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel is this good news that all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. And that because man has sinned they, and they can't fix it, Jesus Christ has come and he's died and paid the penalty for sin and he rose again. And when you believe that message and you turn from your sin, you turn from your pride, and you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, you can become born again. 
And the reason people hate the Jews is because Satan knows that if he can destroy the Jews, he can thwart God's plan of bringing in a worldwide kingdom and bringing in salvation to humanity. And so he's always been trying to destroy the Jewish people. So, listen, we all struggle with pride. The believer is working to get it under control. The unbeliever doesn't. Fear it. I'm telling you, fear it. That's why you need to become a believer. Second, know that there's no no there's no no peace with people who um, who don't know Jesus. You know, no no God, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. No God, and K N O W, K N O W Jesus, and you have peace. So. Make Jesus a part of your story. We all love stories, but the story of your life is personally to each one of you the greatest story. Look, Haman went and had a bad story for his life. He went to a dinner party and thought he had God's favor, but in actuality, he didn't. He thought he had his, his God's favor, and he didn't. It, it ended up destroying him. Oh. At the next part, dinner party he'll go to, his life will fall apart, and he'll be executed. And ha but Haman never asked why he was at that dinner party. And like I said, today we have a dinner party. And if you were to ask, why, are, why am I here? Because we love you. We care for you here at Christian Fellowship Church. And, you know, this is what we'll tell people on the Sunday that they attend our Thanksgiving outreach. So when we're there, when they are there, we would tell them, because we're here to give you the gospel. And that's what I'm doing through this video. So today you can recognize that if you know Jesus, you'll be at the greatest dinner party ever, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And my hope and my desire is that you're all there and that all the people that you love, that you invite, come with you as well. God bless.